Screenless. Hello, and welcome to another creative cuppa. I hope you're doing well given the current circumstances. My guest today was introduced to me by a social media consultant called Ed Goodman. Ed runs a brilliant Facebook group called Freelance Heroes. So if you're a freelancer, go and take a look. It's full of people giving all sorts of support to each other. So thanks, Ed, for the recommendation. If you're sitting comfortably then, cuppa in hand, enjoy this chat with military historian Peter Hart. Peter Hart, author, military historian, podcaster, punk... Welcome to Creative Cuppa. Thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. You're very welcome. I say punk in the most complimentary way, as you are in a punk band, aren't you? I am. Those naughty lumps. Uh, a man and boy, as they say. <laughs> or boy and man. <laughs> you were just explaining to me before we hit record that you are one of the original punks. So it might yes. be unusual to other people to see uh, someone of your years as a punk. But to you, it's the most natural thing in the world. Well, it was just, it depends on what age you are. You, 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 you are, somebody once said about being in the First World War, it's determined by the date of your birth. And, yeah. and, and because I was born in 1955, I was at the right age, 21, 22, to be a punk in 1976. And uh, so that's all it is. It's, uh, it's just the natural way you go. Also, I wasn't a musician, so I had to be a punk. <laughs> so tell me the name of your band those, again those naughty lumps it's ridiculous you can find us on spotify okay i will put a link to your band in the show notes Thank you. There, so listeners can uh, have a listen to that so you have embraced creative ways of delivering your military history work through books and a great podcast i was listening to that earlier uh, which we'll get on to shortly but would you say writing has been a natural extension of that passion for history Yes, because otherwise, where are you going with it? What are, what are you trying to do? To me, history isn't something that you gather into yourself and sort of clutch clutch there like some miser gathering <laughs> historical facts just for your own uh, gratification, if you like. Once you've amassed knowledge about something, you, you want to tell other people. You want other people to share in it. And that was what... Uh, what first drove me on. My first book was on Gallipoli and that was because I'd been interviewing for the Imperial War Museum. I'd interviewed a load of Gallipoli veterans and what they told me was so excitingly, interestingly horrible, horrible, mm. uh, dysentery, things like that, awful things, deaths, friends died, it's all, it's all there. And I wanted to share it and so I wrote my first book. In those days, it was not about money. It was about wanting to do it, wanting it, just something. Yeah. I mean, at the time, I thought I'd write one or two books at most, and uh, here we are, yeah. 20 books later. Oh, wow, um, wow. So that first book, did you? was it a, a very natural outpouring, or did you really have to sit down and think, right, how am I going to structure this? How, how did you go about it? Well, the way I've, I've always structured my books, and I came upon it first, was to have a, a, what we call an academically sound structure. So as far as you can go, it, it met the academic uh, standards of the time. And that's now 20 years ago. And I, I, funnily enough, I had to make some changes later on when I wrote another book on Gallipoli. And then you layer in the personal experience, uh, always analysing it to see whether it, it, it makes sense, whether it is feasible. Uh, yeah. Because one thing about uh, oral history uh, and personal experience his history is how do you decide what's true and what's not? And it's quite difficult. If I told you I'd had bacon and eggs for breakfast, how would you know? <laughs> Have I or haven't that? Good point. Unless I've got bacon uh, sort of egg <laughs> down the front, because we can see each other on Zoom, um, <laughs> then you wouldn't know. Uh, and yeah. similarly, you don't know what true. What you have to do is look for the balance of probability. Uh, and also, don't treat veterans like plaster saints they're just ordinary human beings they they like us they exaggerate they they lie some of them very few but because wow. you, yeah but some of them do and and also they get confused they get dates wrong they get things wrong and you have to just sort of find your way through to a balance of probability which is i think the, the most you can get we did try a later approach uh, which was quite interesting which was we interviewed 50 people from one unit but that was the second world war and they were still alive when we did that in the 1980s and 90s and that is even more fascinating because they're it's not like they're all in different units here they're all 
in the same unit and there's if you hold your hand up you can see through it but if you hold two hands up there's not many gaps is there and if you imagine 50 hands then you've got a complete picture of an event and what's exciting about that is it just gives you a level of detail that you don't find anywhere else you it's it's like an insight into another world and the thing about even the second world war is it's in many many ways the same people Mm. don't change you know they are just as they are But the fascinating thing is that some things are different and you get a sort of insight, uh, to use a posh and creative word, you get an insight into the nitty gritty, the zeitgeist of the era. Some things just stand out. I was talking about one thing the other day, they they often talked about Brill Cream. Brill Cream? (laughs) (laughs) To a man of my generation, that was was just not on. But funnily enough, it's now coming back a bit, I believe. Young people tell me, I wouldn't know. (laughs) Do you see what I mean? Uh, and yeah. so uh, that's fascinating. And you get outriders, you get people who just don't agree with the others. Mm. But you have to just, as I say, work out who's likely to be right. Occasionally you'll put in an outrider just to show what some people thought was going on. Yeah. Uh, it's a fascinating process. Your, your latest book, The Gallipoli Evacuation, did you follow that chronologically or, was, or do you have a different approach? How did you go about that? I tend to have, a in all my books, It's fundamentally chronological because that's the way we're wired. I believe human Mm. beings are wired to understand. I suppose that's the way history happens as well. Yes. And if you go away from and but then I will break off into thematic things because some thematic things will just disrupt the story. So you have to actually break off and have a little bit of a chat about that and then come back to the main story. An editor. uh, I I actually really respect the role of editor. I had an editor, uh, Keith Lowe, who wrote a who's written several great books himself now on post-Second World War. And he said, you have to have a narrative drive. If you're writing, and even in a history book, if it doesn't conform to the narrative drive, and I don't mind mean cutting out things because you don't like the history. I mean, you just arrange it so that there's a, a natural excitement, uh, a build into a climax and perhaps a drop and then another climax uh, yeah. without changing the history. But it's possible you can do this. Uh, and that's part of the writing process for me. It's quite, yeah. it's good fun. It's, it's something to do in an evening, especially now. <laughs> Funnily enough, and, and this is partly why I started this podcast in the first place, is tr- to try and find those common threads that go through all these different creative jobs. And you've just hit on one that comes up again and again and again. Narrative drive, a.k.a. storytelling. And you can have storytelling in, well, any creative medium. If it's a photo, you're looking for a story if it's a TV programme, film, you know, fashion. It's all about what's the story because we as human beings love stories. It's just so important to get that creative. Before you start a book, you have to know where you're going with it. You have to know. So you, you can't, you have to know what the story is before you start. Yeah. And, and that's crucial. You don't have to know all the details of it, but you have to understand where you're going. Otherwise, the reader won't understand. And uh, with a military history book, it, it can be quite dull if you don't engage the reader. And a lot of military history books are dull. Uh, there's no two ways about it, <laughs> especially academic ones who, right. who seem to think that just using three words where one will do gives them some sort of kudos. I, I find some of them difficult. On the other hand, the academics provide and inform the framework of my books. So I, I don't denigrate their work. It's just sometimes some of them are great writers. So many of them aren't. Yeah. And delivery is something that you have certainly addressed in your podcast because you have this very honest Uh, sometimes brutal delivery of things that have gone on. And um, I urge listeners to go and listen to your podcast because it's almost like a reality check, really. Nowadays, we have this kind of almost rose-tinted view of war, and you don't dress it up at all, do you? I think that's because of my background in personal experience history, both uh, the oral history interviews where you really learn what it was like, and, and then again, personal experience accounts. What's interesting for me is things like dysentery at Gallipoli. Let's just go back to the very start for me. Yeah. I was astonished by how bad it was. This isn't a bad curry and a little bit of upset tummy. This is going to the loo 15 times a night. It's the practicalities that come out of how you wipe your backside. It's awful. But one terrible interview I did, the he, uh, bloke they were carrying to the loo fell in and drowned. It's just oh. too or Yes. It's too awful. And... Whew, this is yeah. the reality of war. Uh, 
People thought that the enemy were using, generally think the enemy are using explosive bullets, dum dum bullets. That's because the impact of a bullet on the human body is appalling. It just mm. smashes it. It, it, it. And this is all terribleness. I have no opinion of the glory or the, the, the romance of war. To me, it's a brutal business. But to me, it's interesting. That's the thing. Uh, I'm not sure we can. I, I'm not sure. People say, oh, the past is our future. <laughs> but I, do you know what? To me, it's just interesting. I'm not sure it is our future. I'm not sure you can draw great conclusions from it. It's just interesting. And like any other creative art, that's where you're going with. You want people to engage, to be interested in something. And as you said, whether it's dressmaking or theatre, you want people to engage. That's why you're doing it. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. So why the podcast? Why did you choose podcasting as a kind of delivery system for your military work? It was, in one sense, it, it wasn't me. It was uh, a, an Australian historian who I knew. Uh, in fact, I'd worked for him as a tour guide. Uh, and he, uh, he just suggested it. And I thought, I can't do that. And then I thought of getting a chum in, uh, in this case, Gary Bain, who's my partner in the podcast. Although it's called Peter Hart's Military History. It's actually <laughs> Pete, Pete and Gary. And it, the idea was two blokes in a pub talking through a different episode of Military History each week. No, without the swearing and the farting that normally a company uh, pub go, but but more just a slightly jovial bit. Uh, only jovial when it's appropriate, because sometimes it's just not appropriate. Yeah. You can't have a laugh about terrible things. But and we just talk things through uh, with me providing a historical background, and we use people quotes read by the pair of us. Uh, occasionally in silly voices. I do have a fondness for blood knock, and of course, senior <laughs> officers do tend to, ah, I tell you, there's a curse on the house of heart. <laughs> I was going to say this morning, I was listening to your French accent thinking, oh, yes, it reminds me of, uh, is it Peter Sellers and the Goons? I'm a big fan of the Goon <laughs> Show. I mean, some of it is uh, dodgy these days, but uh, but it's just such a wonderful uh, programme, yeah. and, and the voices do inform me. I, I've been listening to them a lot in lockdown, that hasn't helped. So, so uh, it, for me, it was a way of getting stuff out, uh, another way of communicating. Uh, and let's be brutally honest, it's also a way of getting your name out there, of selling, of moving on as a historian. Because uh, yeah. you can't stand still. And I've been just writing books for 20 years, and this was a new chance. And it was before COVID. I'm not sure whether COVID has helped or hindered. We do do them on Zoom, but it's not the same as being in the same room and, and engaging with people. Uh, but uh, as we're finding now, because we can see each other through Zoom, this is the next best thing. It's the yeah. uh, it's all we've got. So yeah. So your latest book, the Gallipoli evacuation, is out now. It is. It is. Uh, you can get it now on. You can only. Uh, I'm not sure about shops. You can order it through livinghistorytv.com. I think there'll probably be a link somewhere. Uh, and it, it's been great fun to write. That was a COVID book. I was meant to deliver it in uh, October, and I just got stuck in. Um, in, in lockdown and just got on with it. I'd, I'd collected all the sources and so wrote it in January, February, March. Uh, well, it was a wonderful experience. I've enjoyed it enormously. It's got the most classic first great mistake in the first line. Ooh. <laughs> I just love it. It's a, I've just got 1915 instead of 1916. And it just made me laugh when someone pointed it out. Because I love mistakes that are just, once you've made it, it's a typo. It's, I know. I always yeah. did. It's a typo. <laughs> but once a typo like that is made, it's always, you ask any writer, if it's nearly right, or indeed right for most of the book, it's impossible to spot. I loved it. But it made me laugh a lot. Matt was Matt McLaughlin, the uh, the editor wasn't too pleased. I enjoyed telling him. <laughs> well, now everyone knows. So, yes. Uh, when they go and uh, buy a book, they they'll know that it's 1960 <laughs> instead. That's it. Fantastic. You mentioned living history there where can people find you online uh, i know you have a facebook page our uh, well, facebook page is uh, peter hart and peter hart's military history uh, uh, there are also twitter accounts under those names the the main thing is at the moment bookshops seem to be up in the air so it's it's just mm. online uh, it is what it is you you can't worry about sales and things that much at a time yeah. like this, just to just get on with it. I'm, I'm, I've got obsessed with the Sudan now, uh, the uh, Egypt and the Sudan <laughs> campaigns, 1882 to, to 19, 19, 1898. That's another typo. And uh, <laughs> what, what's funny about that is I was just doing a podcast on uh, Douglas Haig as a young officer in the Sudan. And I thought, this is interesting. And before I knew I'd bought 50 books, my wife was going berserk wow. at the number amount of money I was spending. And I've had, to, I've had to sell a load of books <laughs> to make space. It's just... 
that's the next interest and that, that's why yeah. creativity is such fun and you move on that is very very true for now Peter Hart thank you for joining me for a cuppa thank you very much I've enjoyed it Thanks again to Peter. It's funny that, isn't it, about the common threads that go through these creative jobs. Storytelling or narrative is definitely something that features heavily in most, if not all, creative endeavours. Let me know if you have more ideas about that. You can find me on the social media using at Screenless Pod. And on the Facebook page, there's now a Creative Cuppa group where you can come and interact and even have an actual cuppa in the video room there. Links are in the show notes. That's all for now. So until next time... Thanks for joining me for a cuppa.